Hello, out in podcast land, and welcome to Gen X Cinema Geeks. Uh, we are a pair of geeks uh, from Generation X, and this is our podcast. Welcome to the first inaugural episode where we basically count down our top 10 favorite films from the Gen X generation. I am Chris. I am joined here by my movie snob brother, Rich. I am indeed a movie snob, and boy, are you guys in for some snobby treats. I, on the other hand, am far more hashtag basic. Uh, these are our favorite films. Keep in mind, these are not um, necessarily critically acclaimed, you know, uber intellectual movies or Hollywood blockbusters or Academy Award darlings. These are the movies we thought were the best year by year in some of our famous uh, favorite decades for films, uh, starting with the 90s. So today, being episode number one, we have decided to start, ironically, with 1990. How about that? Seemed like a good idea at the time. I think what we're probably going to do is go through the 90s year by year, and then into the 2000s, possibly into the 2000 teens, and then circle back to the 80s, just for funsies, because because we just like to do things a little different here. Yes, and if any of you want to... Follow us along on that journey. Hey, we're thrilled to have one of you, if I'm being honest. Uh, maybe given, even two. <laughs> maybe two, given that this is podcast number one. But hoping we can pick up a few along the way. And uh, by the time we circle back to the 80s, we'll have so many of you that will be excited for the 80s that you will see the genius in our plan. Maybe we should probably tell our two listeners a little bit about us and why we are qualified to be cinema geeks in the first place. Well, let's be honest, we're not. Um, <laughs> we're just normal people with normal opinions, and for some reason we thought y'all might want to know them. Um, we, I both, worked, we both worked at Blockbuster Video at one point, so that definitely qualifies right. us. So we have shelved these movies and rewound them at some point in our lives. Uh, basically, we just watch a lot of movies and, um, have, many debates and have many opinions. <laughs> Yeah, opinions, debates, and sometimes yes. fisticuffs over that. But if you're looking for actual like filmmaking, film writing, film editing qualifications, yeah, well, we both grew up in Southern California, Hollywood adjacent, uh, and that's about it. So knowing that going in, I hope that you enjoy us simply for our witty banter and our uh, or just banter fantastic taste. That's what you're here for. Yeah. Right. So we're gonna go. Uh, We'll both do our number 10s, both do our number 9s, and so forth and so on. So you would like to start, I believe, with your number 10 for the year 1990. I am going to start with my number 10, and thank you for allowing it. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> uh, my number 10 for 1990, which actually, I mean, it was, uh, like I said before, the 90s were a fantastic decade. I think uh, 1990 kind of kicked that off. Uh, my nine, uh, number 10 is uh, directed by Kevin Costner and starring Kevin Costner, Mary McDonald, Graham Greene, filmed on location in Badlands National Park, South Dakota. My number 10 film from 1990 is Dances with Wolves. Um, why is it number 10? I know, I know it was an Oscar darling and you guys are like, why is it number 10? Are you serious? Is she really that bad? No, it, you know, it was a little, it was a little slow for me in a lot of places. Um, it didn't move at the pace that I typically like my movies to move at. It was, it was kind of long, but um, it's a beautiful movie. It's beautifully shot. It's beautifully scored. Um, it is a it, it is a good story. Uh, it's well acted. Um, you don't have, you know, Kevin Costner messing up an accent. So that, <laughs> that's got to be seen in its favor. <laughs> um, but, I mean, there's a lot of really, really stunning scenes and uh, a lot of good action. And um, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's quite a good movie. Um and that's why it is uh, actually my top ten. Yeah, and it might feature later on in this list. How about that? So my number ten, being that this is the day after Christmas, uh, is going to be a Christmas movie that came out this year. The third highest grossing movie of the year, only behind Ghost and Pretty Woman. It is Home Alone, starring Macaulay Culkin, Joe Pesci, who's clearly having the time of his life, along with Daniel Stern. The Wet Bandits. The Wet Bandits. Yeah. Catherine O'Hara is in this. John Hurd. Uh, John Candy. John Candy in a great, great small cameo. Uh, it's. I actually heard a, a person recently refer to this movie as We Need to Talk About Kevin McAllister. 
because he's a little psychopath <laughs> and it's really hard not to argue that it is actually quite easy <laughs> to argue that <laughs> he just likes cheese pizza people he did yeah <laughs> so anyway if you haven't seen this movie uh and i'm sure you have but it is about uh, kevin McAllister, a eight to nine year old boy who was accidentally left behind when his parents jet off to paris and then he has to defend his home from the wet bandits the notorious burglars who are prowling in his uh, area and uh, he sets up a series of elaborate traps to thwart said bandits while his mother desperately tries to get back home because she's terrified because she left her child at home so it's a very fun family friendly christmas movie it has a great score from john williams and a pretty good performance from culkin considering he was just a little guy and uh, but Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern are definitely having the time of their life playing the victims of his malicious booby traps. And they are painful, <laughs> to be sure. But it is a funny movie. It is hysterical and uh, it has a very happy ending. And that's what you need from a Christmas movie. So that's my number 10, Home Alone. I love Home Alone. And as you teased out last time, it may feature a little bit higher in my list. Uh, but for right now, we're on to my number nine, uh, which was written written and directed by Alan Moyle, starring Christian Slater and Samantha Mathis, uh, has a freaking amazing soundtrack. My number nine from 1990 is Pump Up the Volume. It is, <laughs> Come on. It is a perfect Generation X film, actually, about um, Mark, who's a new student in town, and he uses his shortwave radio to create a pirate broadcast. He, of course, wins over the student population with his rebellion and uh, pisses off authority in the meantime, which is a perfect Gen X theme. Um, many themes, you know, that spoke to me when I was a teenager seeing this movie for the first time, you know, his angst, rebellion, the aversion to authority. Um, there is a tragedy that, that occurs at his school and it kind of sets the authorities out after the pirate radio jock to shut him down. Um, kind of a dramatic movie has a lot of great themes, as I said. Um, but you know, it is a, it is a teenager's dream film. And again, it's got the, probably my favorite version of wave of mutilation. Like you said, the pixies on the soundtrack, it's actually a really, really good soundtrack. Uh, Christian Slater, arguably at his dramatic best in this film. Um, not even arguably, <laughs> yeah, not even arguably. <laughs> it's a, it's one that kind of gets overlooked in the canon of teen films that came out in the '90s, um, but it should not be. It's fantastic. It is a good movie, and the soundtrack also includes Peter Murphy of Bauhaus fame and uh, Concrete Blonde and some other great bands. It's just, I played that soundtrack to death. I think I had to buy the tape twice because I wore out one of them. It was that good. Also, the first thing I've ever seen Samantha Mathis in, to be honest, and um, she really, she really stood out. She did a great She's job. She's very underrated, I think. She's quite good in future 90s movies. So my number nine is uh, based on a play directed by Tom Stoppard, written by Tom Stoppard, and is about a play within a play, actually. It's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Uh, this is a funny, funny, quirky movie. It's very idiosyncratic. Gary Oldman, his face... I don't know how he does it. He acts with his face in this movie so much. It is fantastic. Tim Roth also acts with his face. The story is about two minor characters from Shakespeare's Hamlet and how they have their own story kind of going in the background while Hamlet goes on. But they kind of switch it and they're in the foreground and Hamlet is in the background. And it's just it's just a quirky little film. I love how Gary Oldman keeps like making these scientific breakthroughs <laughs> like the hamburger, for example, and <laughs> biplanes yeah. and biplanes and water displacement. And then Tim Roth just keeps destroying it within seconds. And Richard Dreyfus is in this too, and he's kind of a, a sleazy kind of a character, and he's having a ball too. It's a fun, quirky little movie, and I, I don't know. I, I keep calling it quirky, and I can't think of another word to describe it. It's kind of a shame too, because this is the one and only movie Tom Stoppard directed. He's known as a writer, and he's a great writer, but, you know, I don't know why he only directed the one film. So that's our loss. Tom, come on, man. Do another one. Seriously. Heads. Heads. <laughs> Heads. 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 If you've seen it, you know. If you haven't seen it, you really should. Um, not to beat the now dead horse that is um, 
Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, but it is my number eight oh, as well, fabulous. actually. So yeah. um, continuing a little bit, I I also really enjoyed this movie. Um, as you said, it's about two really nothing characters from the Hamlet play uh, who sort of get their own storyline as they rendezvous with their their portion of Hamlet, basically. Um, and I liked it for the same reason you did. It is unexpectedly brilliant <laughs> in a lot of places. It is, it's very understated comedy, which is the kind that I like. I don't like in your face, slapstick, you know, um, bathroom type humor. I like a little bit more well-written flies under the radar situational type humor. And that's exactly what this delivers. Um, I, who knew Gary Oldman could do comedy <laughs> in the first place? Gary Oldman can do anything. <laughs> but he, it's probably true. But he is actually amazing in this film and um, it's so funny. He's just, I also like that you never really know which one is Rosencrantz and which one are, is Guildenstern. And they kind of gloss over that throughout the entire movie. They both, you know. It's like a running gag. <laughs> either one could be either, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and no one would know any different. Um, because they are such nothing characters from Hamlet. So it's not really important, to be honest. Um, if you haven't seen this movie, you really should track it down and watch it. It is very funny, um, especially if you like under the radar, quirky kind of comedy. Um, this, There's that word again. <laughs> this is certainly the film for you. Yeah, it is very quirky. How many times have we called this movie quirky in the last 10 minutes? Well, I only did once, but I think yeah. you kind of set the record. <laughs> yeah, but there really is no other way to describe it. So. My number eight movie cannot be described as quirky. It is an action epic World War II movie directed by Michael Catton Jones. I hope I said that name right. Memphis Bell with Matthew Modine, Eric Stoltz, Harry Connick Jr., who we get to hear sing Danny Boy in the movie. Fantastic. We get Samwise Gamgee, Sean Astin. And somehow it's not on the soundtrack. How are you going to let Harry Connick Jr. sing and not put it on the soundtrack? That is a crime against humanity. Uh, yeah, Sean Astin, uh, Billy Zane before he became Cal Hockley on the Titanic. This is a movie about the final mission of the Memphis Bell plane. Uh, it has to do one more mission before it can be retired and they can all go home. And of course, it's not an easy mission as they have to fly into Germany and bomb a factory. And it's filled with heroism and nail-biting tense situations and lots of aviation stunts and it's... Uh, it's a, just a great, heroic, gung-ho World War II movie. The, the kind that they really don't make anymore. The let's go on the mission, boys, kind of a, a movie. And lots of really good special effects, mostly practical. And I like practical effects. So I, I would have to say, I like this movie, too. It's not, it's not on my list, but it is a good movie. And I, I don't think you can... Um overstate how amazing david strathairn is in this movie and really just about everything that he does he's almost every movie's mvp but he is so um he's very stoic as the leader of the base and but you can tell that even though he has to put on this you know brave face for all of his soldiers that his heart absolutely breaks every time he loses one um but he still stays the course for the ones that remain and he is uh he is a treasure in this film, actually. He, he really is. And the scenes he has against John Lithgow, who is also a treasure, are really, really well done. They actually uh, are a pretty good sort of B-plot to the, <laughs> to the story of the main plot. And I really like Eric Stoltz's character in this, too. He's very uh, he's kind of like the glue that holds the team together. Like, everyone loves his character. So, like, he's like the unofficial mascot of the plane. Uh, and I just like how he played it. It's... It's very, very well done. And a special shout out to D.B. Sweeney, too, who plays a character who finds his courage. Uh, oh, and, he's at like the, the cowardly lion. Yeah, <laughs> he, he kind of is. He's very afraid. He's, he thinks the mission's going to go south because why wouldn't it? It's his last one, and that's usually when it goes south. But he uh, he finds his courage at the end and you know has his moments. So good on you, D.B. I really like him, too. Actually, he's just a he's a good actor anyway. Uh, number seven on my list is also an ensemble of young um, up-and-comers from the day. It was directed by Joel Schumacher, starring Keeper Sutherland, Kevin Bacon, which starring Kevin Bacon means you could probably connect it to every other movie we're going to talk about today. Um, Julia Roberts, <laughs> William Baldwin, and 
the incomparable Oliver Platt, who is hilarious in just about everything he does. And of course, talking about flatliners. Um, it is about a group of medical students who devise a plan to stop and restart their own hearts to gain near death experiences. And, uh, they find themselves throughout this process, bringing back some of the sins from their pasts as they go deeper and deeper under and having to kind of reconcile some of the past pain in their lives in order to move forward. Um, I really like this movie because, you know, it's a very original storyline. When I saw this movie, I had never seen anything like this before in the theater. I had actually got remade recently. Did I watch the remake? No, of course I didn't, because why would you do such a thing when you have this kind of a cast to begin with? Um, it's, a really good cast. <laughs> it's it's an entertaining movie. Um, Kiefer Sutherland does a great job playing, you know, insecure and <laughs> low self-esteem, which is, is not, you know, his typical, especially if you saw him in The Lost Boys. Um, yeah, but it's just, uh, you know, it, like I said, it's a real original storyline. It, um, it, it was something I'd never seen in the theater before. I think it was fresh um, for the time. I think it uh, used the cast that it had to great advantage. And um, just a really, really interesting, dramatic. I like dramas. I'm not going to lie. Um, so it uh, was right up my alley. And I think it's pretty, pretty great movie. OK, that is a great movie. It brings me to my number seven. And before I bring that out, I want to bring out a little bit of note of trivia here. There's a scene in 1989 when Harry Met Sally, directed by Rob Reiner, where Billy Crystal, who states in the movie that he reads the last page of a book first in case he dies is seen reading Misery by Stephen King. Hmm. And that was a kind of a foreshadowing because Rob Reiner was already preparing his movie version of Misery at that time. It was kind of a little in-joke in the movie. Uh, you have to blink, or you can't blink, and you'll miss it uh, in When Harry Met Sally, but it is a funny little joke. I missed it, so I must have blinked every time I've seen When Harry Met Sally, which is an excessive amount. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, needless to say, my number seven is Rob Reiner's Misery. Uh, of course, based on the novel by Stephen King, starring Kathy Bates, holy crap, and James Caan. This is a very slow burn thriller, and I mean slow burn. It's about a novelist. Is he a romance novelist? I, I don't know if he's a romance novelist. He is, yeah. Yeah, and he writes a series of books centering around a character named Misery. And as he finishes his last book, he is in a very terrible car wreck, and he's saved by his number one fan, and it becomes a cat and mouse game as he recovers and recuperates in her house and she pretty much has no intention of ever letting him go and oh it is taut it is suspenseful the chemistry between Khan and Bates who won the Academy Award that year and rightly so is palpable I love this movie and oof Rob Reiner was on a tear too he had already done Spinal Tap Princess Bride uh when Harry met Sally and stand by me. And then he just did this and it was just like, wow, he was on a roll. It's a lot less gory than a lot yeah. of Stephen King stories. Uh, but the suspense factor is just off the charts. Yeah. The suspense is off the charts, as you said, but there is one scene that is, Ooh. that is very gory and, uh, huh. my ankles hurt. Just thinking about yes, it. Yes. <laughs> the ankle scene. You, if you've seen it, you know it. And if you haven't seen it, don't let the little kids watch it because, Ouch. That's all I'm going to say is ouch. Uh, but yeah, Misery is my number seven. And uh, Kathy Bates is just terrific in the film. She, Like I said, she won the Academy Award. And wow, it's it was a star-making performance. She is so creepy, so subtle, so kind of in your face, really. And sit, so sweet in some scenes, too. And so like naive and just it's chilling. She's really, really chilling. I agree. And uh, I think it's also on my list, but maybe a little higher up. Uh, my number six, though, is touching on one that you already talked about, and that is the holiday classic directed by John Hughes. Excuse me, written by John Hughes, directed by Chris Columbus, Home Alone. You already kind of um, went into the cast to give it that pedigree. Uh, I will say this movie's got to be one of the reasons that Generation X has trust issues because they didn't just, the parents didn't just jet off to Paris. They took the entire family except for their child. Um, and they left him behind. I, I will defend Kevin McAllister and say that he is in no way a psychopath. This is a small, scared kid 
who has people trying to break into his house while he is home by himself. So if he created a creepy fun house, you know, maybe don't try to rob from the house where you know the child's staying by himself. Um, They're very magical. <laughs> his, his traps. For me, I love the charm of this movie. Um, I, I, I love the relationship he's able to forge with the scary neighbor who's really not that scary at all. Um, yeah, I love the music. I love the, the fact that Kevin learns to appreciate his family um, that he, you know, that his mother moves a heaven and earth to get home to him, even taking a ride in a van with a bunch of polka bums. Um, it's just uh, the charm here is off the charts. Obviously, it's a little bit polka, polka. polka. Obviously, it's a little far fetched of a storyline. Um, but, you know, sometimes you got to go that route to get the movie that you want. Um, and this movie is fantastic. It's a great holiday film. It's, uh, you know, celebrates family, celebrates, you know, home and um, all those good and wonderful things highlighted, punctuated, if you will, by the fantastic John Williams. Yeah, John Williams. Who knew he can score comedy, you know, but he does it so well. He can well. score anything. That is very true. <laughs> John Williams is a national treasure. Speaking of terrific scores, my number six movie also has a terrific score and won the Academy Award that year for it. And as a movie you've already mentioned, Dances with Wolves. It's my number six. Directed by Kevin Costner, as you said, it is a epic grandeur of a film. It has kind of like a Lawrence of Arabia feel to it. It's a throwback to classic epics, if you will, like the aforementioned Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Trivago, those kind of things. I feel like it ushered in some westerns too. Yeah, it really did. It kind of revitalized the western genre, and it did clean up at the Academy Awards that you're winning Best Picture and Best Director. And it's it's not hard to see why. I think there was another movie that was better directed that year, but I'm not hateful that it won. <laughs> it's 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 a fantastic, epic, a man versus nature kind of a story. Um, it's also kind of man versus himself. Yeah, it in really a lot is. of ways. And on a technical note, I got to give it up to that buffalo hunt sequence. I don't know how they did that. That is, some of those buffaloes I know were mechanical, and it is so well filmed, so well edited. Um, edited? God, I'm having <laughs> trouble with words lately. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll let it fly. It's episode number one. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Sorry, folks. <laughs> um, but no, it's it's a it's a grand a grand epic in the old. Hollywood tradition, and like you said, it did usher in a new generation of westerns. Um, I'm sure Clint Eastwood had definitely agrees. <laughs> you know, Clint Eastwood was watching it, and he was like, "Damn, was like, that Kevin kid! I need to work with him." <laughs> he just killed that. All right, uh, moving on to my number five, and I'm going to tell you, I I believe strongly in this movie. Although I was reading some comments um, in a Gen X group that I am in, and somebody listed it as the worst movie they'd ever seen. So they my uh, <laughs> my confidence is a little shaken. But then again, this is you know our podcast, and like I said at the beginning, these are the movies that we like. So it just brings up a really interesting point, though, that movies are a very personal thing. That some movies resonate with people that other people hate. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt that I love this movie. <laughs> I promise I have good taste. Um, it was written and directed by John Patrick Shanley. It is one of the lesser known Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan movies that they did together. Uh, it is called Joe versus the Volcano. It's actually Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan and Meg Ryan and Meg Ryan because she plays three different roles in this movie. It stars Lloyd Bridges and Dan Hedaya, who is always hilarious uh, to watch. Also a national treasure so many national treasures uh it is about um an increasingly dehumanized little worker drone named joe banks um his job is horrific <laughs> uh and he it, it makes him feel horrible uh in his health in his life he used to be a firefighter and so he's kind of now in this like gray miserable cubicle hell the way they depict that office is just <laughs> if you've ever worked in an office and felt like a cubicle drone and you haven't seen this movie, you really ought to. Um, he's given a terminal diagnosis uh, by a very, very elite doctor. And um, then he gets visited by like a multi-gazillionaire who offers to um, give him a ton of money if he will live out his final days living like a hero, 
by jumping into a volcano. <laughs> so really kind of a long premise there. Uh, the volcano happens to be on an island where the multi-gazillionaire um, mines a certain mineral and where the natives are addicted to orange soda. It is actually, <laughs> they are, <laughs> um, it, it, it's kind of a sweet movie about finding a purpose in your life, um, about, you know, the fact that you shouldn't wait until you think you're going to die before you start to live. It's a very life-affirming film. It absolutely makes the point that you should always buy the best luggage that you can afford. Um, <laughs> if you've seen it, you'll know. If you haven't, those steamer trunks are amazing. Um, it's just a real sweet movie. The chemistry between Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan was so good that they put them in like three movies together. Um, At and, least three. Yeah, and you just... Um, you know, if you're if you're into those kind of movies, just kind of life affirming, romantic comedy, a little bit of action, a lot of fun. Uh, Joe versus a volcano, my number five. Maybe the people in your Gen X group are suffering from a brain cloud. <laughs> That's possible. It's entirely possible. So I know I kind of beat the word quirky to death a little earlier, but there's no other way to describe my number five movie than quirky. Uh, it was the directorial debut of Whit Stillman. It is Metropolitan. Uh, he also directed it and wrote it and produced it. And I believe he even edited edited. There's that word again. Uh, <laughs> he cut it up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a hard word to say sometimes. Um, the cast, mostly non-professional, no-name actors. Um, but some of them went on to other things. Some of them did not. Uh, Chris Eigman is probably the most known because he's a later appeared in movies by Noah Baumbach and a few others. Uh, it's about a middle-class New York young man who sort of accidentally finds himself interacting with some rich society teenagers and young people. They're kind of like debutantes, and he gets whisked into their world, and he learns that despite their privilege and their, and their well-to-do attitudes, that they're actually kind of vapid and and uh, kind of up their own bums if you will but it's just so funny it's so acerbic and uh it's it's just got you know great dialogue that there's only what stillman can write um it's as they call it themselves downwardly mobile it's kind of just like <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> it's, it's this kind of like snapshot of these kids as they sort of grapple with uh their fates are they going to be rich trust fund babies or they are their lives actually going to have some meaning you know or so it's just got some spin-off romances and uh, they have a funny scene where they spend a good portion of time critiquing jane austen and then the one character the young man of the, who's the hero of our story says well, i've never actually read jane austen i just read literary criticism <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Who hasn't read Jane Austen? <laughs> uh apparently the kid in the movie. <laughs> so it's a it's a very warm hearted film despite being also very acerbic and cynical, if that makes sense. But yeah, Whit Stillman was definitely had a voice for this kind of dialogue and it shows in this movie. So Metropolitan is my number five. Seek it out. It's a little bit harder to find. It's on the Criterion channel. Um but yeah, it's it's a it's a classic. Speaking of Jane Austen, as we get further into the 90s, expect to hear a lot of Jane Austen movies in my list because I am a huge fan. I am also a huge fan of my number four. So if you can forgive my cheesy segue, uh, this, movie was, <laughs> this movie was directed by Martin Scorsese. The screenplay was by Martin Scorsese, adapted from Wise Guy by Nicholas Pileggi, starring uh, Robert De Niro, Ray Liotta, Joe Pesci, Paul Sorvino, another national treasure uh and lorraine brocco of course i am talking about goodfellas for as long as i can remember i always wanted to be a gangster um it is based on the real life story of an italian irish american making his way up through organized crime and uh, it kind of chronicles the eventual downfall of the little empire there that he finds himself in um actually you made me watch this movie yeah, uh, did. Yeah. <laughs> you did make me watch this movie and and uh it, it's really quite good the characters are amazing i mean you have some amazing actors in here joe pesci is just he's just a little creep you know yeah he's uh he, he's not very likable at all but yet he's he's one of the guys you know one of the good fellows and so you you kind of care about him even though he's really a terrible person um 
The movie's plotted very well. It's shot very well. I mean, it is the epitome of the 70s. It looks it. It feels it. They speak it. Um, it's a... How many times can you play Layla in the soundtrack? <laughs> it is a classic in the canon of gangster films. So uh, if that's your M.O., by all means, I've probably already seen it, right? I mean, you're all going, yeah, no kidding. Goodfellas is good. Um, it's a... It's an excellent movie. It's a quality uh, entry in the Martin Scorsese um, canon as well. And um, yeah, I did. Perfect gangster flick, right? Violence, swearing, <laughs> police interaction. <laughs> it's, um, it is a gangster movie for the ages. Speaking of gangster movies for the ages, it's on my list, but not quite yet. But another gangster movie is my number four. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. See what I did there? <laughs> You're welcome. I the, teed that up for you. Yeah, the other the <laughs> other great gangster movie from 1990 was directed by the Coen Brothers. It is Miller's Crossing, starring Gabriel Byrne, Albert Finney, Marcia Gay Harden, and John Turturro in a wow performance, in my opinion. It takes place in the 1930s. I'm not going to go too much into the plot of this one because it's kind of there's lots of twists and turns and double crosses and snake in the grass kind of moments. So I'm just going to go geek out more about the technical aspect of it. The Art Deco 30s costumes and sets and cinematography are all fantastic. Um, but yeah, it's basically about a second in command of a mob organization and how he weaves in and out of various plots and intrigues. And uh, like I said, I don't want to give too much away of the plot because it is one you sort of have to watch. But I will say the scene where John Turturro is begging for his life at Miller's Crossing is harrowing. Yeah, he's really, really good in it. <laughs> he really is. And if it wasn't for the fact that like Joe Pesci was like going to win the supporting actor Oscar for the mob movie of the year, Turturro might have had a chance to and he wasn't even nominated. It's kind of a shame, actually. I think uh, Gabriel Byrne was really amazing as well. And I mean, he, really he goes is. through all of the, <laughs> <laughs> all of the emotions in this movie and he carries them all off. Yeah. He's a, he's an underrated actor to be sure. It also has a very understated score by Carter Burwell, who of course uh, collaborated with the Coen brothers on many of their projects. This is a very, very typical movie of the Coen brothers. It's them firing on all cylinders. They did Barton Fink the next year and they just came off of raising Arizona it's kind of in peak Coen Brothers era. It has the Coen Brothers look to it. Oh, yeah. As well. Definitely. And their editing style, too, is all over it. So it's a. It's great. I love it. <laughs> it's great. That's fantastic. Thumbs up from, from me. <laughs> Moving on to my number three, which you already talked about. Um, I'm going to just go off a little more on how great it is. Uh, directed by Rob Reiner, adapted for the screen by William Goldman from the Stephen King novel of the same name. It, of course, is Misery, uh, James Conn, Kathy Bates. I like this movie a little bit better than you, I think. Um, and wow, I think it's because uh, it's because of her. I mean, Kathy Bates, this is the first thing I saw Kathy Bates in ever. And it, it is a star making performance for her. She starts off just this sweet little naive super fan, right? In love with Mis Misery Chastain. And uh, after she finds out that the final book does not go the way she wanted it to, she uh, she keeps him hostage to write the ending that she wants is basically um, how it goes. And the, I mean, she just pivots from sweet and caring and I'm your number one fan to I will kill you <laughs> on a dime and um it is it, it, she takes full advantage of how helpless he is and that's probably the most terrifying part about the movie i think is that you realize just like as it starts to burn it dawns on you that he is in zero position to defend himself from her um and so it's almost a battle of wills and wits uh for him to escape out of this alive and it's it's really kind of a um, the situation itself is the horror. It's a it's a yeah. horror movie. It's classified a horror movie. Um, but like I said before, it's not gory. It's the the situation is is horrific. It's terrifying. It is suspenseful. Um, I think Rob Reiner did a masterful job, especially given that horror is not his his usual. That's not his genre. Um, but he absolutely yeah. builds the suspense. He builds the drama. He lets Kathy bait. He just. It's unshackles her <laughs> yeah he just lets her go 
And uh, it was an excellent decision because she took this movie to, she took it all the way. <laughs> and uh, it's actually really, really amazing. I do like the fun fact that like James Conn, when he's being forced to write this book that he does not want to write, he basically just wings it. <laughs> he phones it in. <laughs> he phones it in. You, you know it's not his best work ever, but she's eating it up anyway because she's so excited to be the first one to read it. Well, and you and you realize that as he's writing this, he's basically playing for time is yeah. what he's doing. Yeah. He's trying to let himself heal. He's trying to work out a way out, you know. And so he just writes to he's Kill time, he's really. writing to appease her enough yeah. that he can figure out how to be less helpless. And it is um, it's it's an incredible movie. It really is. It's fantastic. It's on both of our lists. So therefore, it must be good. So here's a movie that I guarantee is on both of our lists. I'm sure it's still on yours. I'm predicting. Uh, it is my number three is The Hunt for Red October, directed by John McTiernan from a novel by Tom Clancy, starring Sean Connery, Alec Baldwin, the always dependable Scott Glenn. Thank you. Yes, he is the man. Scott you Glenn. You always forget Scott Glenn. I know. Scott Glenn <laughs> is he's he's just the best. Um yeah. Richard Jordan is in this movie. So many great faces. Jeffrey Jones, James Earl Jones. Sam Dar Neill. Sam Neill. Yeah, Sam Neill. He's fantastic. And if you haven't seen it, very briefly, it is a story of a bunch of military organizations trying to locate the submarine, the Red October, because the captain, Marco Ramius, played by Sean Connery, seems to have gone rogue, and they do not know what his intentions are. Is he going to defect, or is he going to fire his missiles and start it? nuclear war so as you can imagine it is a very tense situation and alec baldwin plays a cia analyst cia analyst uh who has to determine what ramius is up to and who is that cia analyst have we heard of him before what's yeah. his name again jack ryan yeah jack ryan jack ryan <laughs> this is the start of the jack ryan film franchise he's great alec baldwin's great in this movie uh sam neill oh sam neill Another national treasure, except for he's Australian, I think. Uh, very cat and mouse, very uh, well plotted, lots of great twists and turns along the way. Nothing is wasted. The movie is well over two hours, but yet it flies by at a brisk pace. It's one of the best military thrillers I've seen personally, and I love all the scenes with Jonesy. <laughs> Seriously, he is the man. Jonesy's the best. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Hunt for October. It is, uh, it's just fantastic. It's a great, great thriller. The kind that they used to make all the time. I miss these kind of movies, actually. To be fair on the National Treasure thing, you did call John Williams a National Treasure as well, and I think he's British. No, he's American. Is John Williams American? Yeah, he was born in Boston, actually. Oh, look at me giving more credit to the... I'm sorry, Britain. I just loaned you John Williams for about two seconds, and I was wrong. But you're going to Google that right now just to see if I'm right. Uh, <laughs> while, we're on, while, while we're on the topic of the Hunt for Red October, uh, it is actually my number two movie. So I'm just going to keep going since cool. it's next on my list anyway. It should be noted that um, the submarine that Ramius absconds with is a top secret nuclear submarine. Um, and this is why it's uh, such a terrifying concept because this movie is meant to be at the height of the Cold War. Um, between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so the one of the... Oh, look at that. He's born in New York. Sorry. sorry. I'm so sorry, Britain. We get, we get to keep John Williams. Um, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the greatest things about this movie, I think, is the, is the unknowing, right? So Jack Ryan is convinced that he's trying to defect and that he's not going to, you know, bomb everybody. But we have to place our trust in Jack Ryan because nobody else knows what the heck's going on. Is he a good guy? Is he not? Um, there's some ambiguity there. Nobody really is sure. I think the action sequences are fantastic. They're not overdone. I think Scott Glenn, of course, is amazing. He's so steadfast in this movie as the uh, commander of the U of uh, the Dallas, yeah, USS the, the submarine Dallas. Um, he is. He's in control at all times, but he's. <sighs> he's a little <laughs> what, do you, what do you say about Scott Glenn, man? I mean, he's just he makes he, he's willing to listen to Ryan, which right. I think makes him really kind of special in this movie. But he also is, you know, a, a sub captain and he has con 
his crew's safety and well-being at heart. Um, is an edge of your seat kind of a thriller. It's gripping. It's taut. I just wanted to use the word taut. taut. It's very point. taut. Yeah, it's a it's a great movie. It was a perfect entry into the Jack Ryan franchise, which of course has gone on to provide us with several uh, super entertaining, fantastic um, feature films and a TV series now. Um, I actually really like uh, John Krasinski as um, Jack Ryan. He's doing a great job. Um, but uh, Hunt for Red October, my uh, number two. It's also got some really good humor in it, too. You know, like the uh, whole, uh, you've lost another submarine. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a great bit, you know. Yes, I won't make you do your Sean Connery impression for the people. Please don't. I will not do it. Uh, so my number two is a movie you've already mentioned, and I hinted that I would be mentioning it too. It is Goodfellas, directed by Marty, Martin Scorsese, uh, De Niro, Pesci, Leota. I mean, seriously, there's no flaws in this movie. I'm not going to go too much into it because you sort of already hit on all the topics I wanted to anyway. But I do want to throw out a special mention to that amazing five-minute unbroken take as Ray Leota whisks Lorraine Bracco into the world of the mafia as he escorts her into the the club there or the nightclub and the camera follows him through the kitchen as he sort of bribes his way and glad hands his way in through it's just a great scene because it just shows that he is he's taking her and the audience with him into this world it's romanticizing it and yet terrifying us at the same time and the fact that they did that all in one unbroken five minute take is fantastic it's just a great great sequence and if there's even if you look carefully there's even a part where ray Liotta bumps into a like a stove in the kitchen or something like that but they kept going because the take was going so well that they just kept it in the movie and he ad-libbed it so perfectly third degree burns keep going keep going <laughs> keep going keep going ray you're doing fine but no it is a uh, it's marty firing on all cylinders it's probably one of his best movies maybe only taxi driver can compare so Oh, good fellas. It's amazing. If you haven't seen it, where have you been? <laughs> well, i tell you where I've been. I've been on my number one, and I'm excited that I get to talk about it because I have a sneaking suspicion since I haven't heard it yet that it's also your number one. Could be. So I get to introduce it, which is actually fun for me. Um, written and directed by Tim Burton, starring Johnny Depp, Winona Ryder, Diane Weiss, Anthony Michael Hall, and a lot of fantastic pastel colors. My number one is Edward Scissorhands. Um, this is what I think. I think this is one of Tim Burton's best films. I think it's one of Johnny Depp's best films, to be honest. He plays the creation of an inventor who dies before he can finish him. Uh, so he does not have actual human hands. He has these scary, creepy scissor concoctions, which if you really think about it, those took more effort to put together than probably human hands would. But I digress. Um, Edward is found by a local woman who's basically like Avon calling. Um, and she brings him down into the suburbs to live with her family. Um, after having been kind of a recluse his entire life with only his creator as a parental figure in his life. So Edward has a steep learning curve and obviously his scary hands make him at first the fright of the neighborhood, but then the darling um, this is just a magical movie. It's a magical movie about who we fear and who we actually probably should fear. Um, the visuals are outstanding. Like I mentioned, those cute little pastel box homes. The whole neighborhood is just this pastel paradise. Um, even all the clothes on all the housewives. I mean, I, you know, I, I think the, uh, the outcast neighbor, isn't she always in black? <laughs> uh, black or red, I think. Yeah, um, the cast is fantastic. There, I mean, there's some just beautiful, beautiful scenes in this movie. I absolutely love the scene there where Winona Ryder is kind of dancing in the eye shower as he's working on the sculpture. Um, it's just a really, really beautiful movie. It's a, it's kind of like a, a modern day fable um, because it has a moral to it. Um, the way they used to write fairy tales, you know, um, he's a lot less scary than, than the people he comes down to live amongst. Um, and it's about judgments and, you know, um, how people tend to fear what they don't understand. And it's just, uh, it's got a beautiful moral compass to it. It's got a beautiful heart to it. Uh, it's just a really sweet, sweet film. I could not agree more because it happens to be my number one as well. Edward Scissorhands is my number one. Yay. 
So touching on some of the things you've already mentioned, um, I too adore the scene where Winona is dancing in the ice and that the music that Danny Elfman did for that scene is probably my favorite bit of Danny Elfman music ever. As far as his film score work is concerned, obviously Uncle Boingo is a separate thing. Uh, but no, I like, I love Edward Scissorhands. I love that it's a, kind of a soft retelling of Frankenstein with a shade of Beauty and the Beast thrown in there. And uh, it, How interesting is it to see Anthony Michael Hall play just a total creep, too? Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's phenomenally bad. He's good at being bad. And <laughs> He went from your classic geek to suddenly like the jock a-hole. <laughs> Yeah, and a special mention must also be given to Vincent Price, who uh, is a veteran of so many classic horror movies, shows up in this one to play this crazed inventor uh, and who actually creates Edward Scissorhands. So it was a great cameo from the legend that is Vincent Price. So that was always fun to see. I love Alan Arkin and Diane Weiss in this movie as the parents, <laughs> especially Arkin. He's just so funny i just he's very deadpan yeah very deadpan he's very good at that sort of like, i can't be bothered deadpan attitude uh this is as you said johnny depp's best work tim burton's best film in my opinion um one of his best kind of have a soft spot for beetlejuice <laughs> <laughs> but uh 1990 was the year of winona this was her probably her most popular movie she did three movies this year and all of them were Modest to good successes. I think Edward Scissorhands was the highest grossing ever movie. She was definitely the indie go-to darling girl of this era. So, And she's fantastic in the movie. Can't say I was crazy about her as a blonde, though. I do prefer as a brunette. Love you, Winona. Well, if you got to have one flaw, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I still want to marry you, Winona. <laughs> no, no, Winona, we need to marry Keanu Reeves and make all of our little Gen X hearts happy. Okay. So you back off. Sorry, Keanu. You can't have her. <laughs> He's Keanu Reeves. He can do whatever he wants. All right. So that wraps up our top tens. Um, hope we didn't scare y'all. I hope uh, you either found something new that you want to watch or you were reintroduced to something that you thought was great. And if you're the person who hated Joe versus the volcano, I apologize. Uh, I, apologize. <laughs> I, was like, I would like at this time to talk about some honorable mentions, movies that we liked that also didn't quite make the cut. Um, for me... That would be Miller's Crossing. I know that made your list. Um, for me, it was not quite there, but it was really, really good film. It it, it could have been there. Um, how about Pretty Woman? I mean, <laughs> this was the year of Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman dominated, um, and it still dominates to this day. It is a cult classic. Everybody loves this movie. Um, you know, it, it it's a good film, and I enjoy watching it. Um, it's a it was a little predictable for me. Um, which is why it didn't quite make the top 10. Yeah. Um, I have Memphis Bell on my honorable mentions. I know that was in your uh, top 10 list. I just think it's a really fun cast. It's a pretty inspiring movie. Um, you know, you're rooting from these guys from the get go and their teamwork and camaraderie is, um, is palpable when you're watching the film. Um, it's a, it, it, it's a good ride and it's, um, you know, it's got a lot of really moving parts in it as well. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Uh, I got a few honorable mentions here, too. Uh, I'm oh, my a, gosh, that list, there's like 10. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there really isn't. Jeez. Some of them you've already mentioned that are on your list. Joe vs. Volcano, Flatliners, and Pump Up the Volume are all in my honorable mentions. I got to give a mention to Ghost, because let's face it, Whoopi steals literally every second she's in in that movie. Oda Mae Brown. Mm -hmm. How can you not love Whoopi? <laughs> uh, May I keep this pen? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I got Arnold's uh, sci-fi epic Total Recall as an honorable mention. That's just a fun Arnold let's go on an adventure kind of a movie as he tries to get to Mars and blows up a bunch of stuff on the way. Uh, uh, speaking of Winona, I have Mermaids on my list. It's a quirky little coming of age story with Cher and Winona and Christina Ricci. Um, Bob Hoskins. Bob Hoskins, yes. I love Bob Hoskins in this. And Jake Ryan. Jake Ryan alert. There it is. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a it's a charming little film. Just missed my list, so uh, yeah, I think that's it. Oh, I, oh, also I want to mention Quick Change, which is an underrated comedy with Bill Murray, who dresses up as a clown and robs a bank. And the only time in a movie where I think a clown is actually acceptable, I just want to say that because it's Bill Murray, and you know it's Bill Murray from minute one. But the fun of the movie is not that he robs a bank. The fun of the movie is him, Randy Quaid, and Gina Davis just trying to get out of New York because they can't do it. It's that's 
It's a very underrated comedy. Seek it out. Quick change. It's very funny. I just, Bill Murray could maybe be a clown, but I don't know. I don't really think. She has it, a thing against. Clowns, I don't really so think anybody. I. Nobody really should, if we're being honest. Um, also, uh, I do have my guilty pleasures, which are uh, what I'm counting as movies that were not. They really weren't like in the top ten, but they're movies that I love and that I could still watch over and over again because they're just there's something special about them or they mean something to me or. You know, you know, those movies, you all have those movies where it's like the script of this is an absolute troll, but the movie's fun to watch. So and I'm not saying the script is a troll at all, but my guilty pleasure for 1990 is Ghost, which you just mentioned. And primarily it's because Whoopi Goldberg is amazing. <laughs> she is so funny in this movie. And I mean, on rewatch later in life, yeah, the tech just has not kept up with the time. <laughs> and it's, it's very sad in a lot of ways. Uh, Tony Goldwyn just plays an absolute creep. Um, But it's got, I mean, the uh, Patrick Swayze gone way, way, way too soon. Uh, He's such a charmer. It's no reason. I mean, it's no wonder everybody was in love with Patrick Swayze. Um, I'm not super into the like overly schmaltzy romantic movies, which is why it's an honorable mention for me. But I think the levity in this movie is provided by Whoopi um, and her fantastic turn as Oda Mae Brown. And she absolutely just walks away with it. Um, and I could I could literally watch her every day. Yeah, she's hysterical. Uh, yeah, I got a couple of guilty pleasures, too. Uh, one of which is a early Liam Neeson movie uh, called Dark Man, which is a comic book movie about a man who is horribly disfigured by bad guys and seeks his revenge. And uh, it's very fun. I have another Arnold movie in, in my... Uh, Guilty indulgences. That's Kindergarten Cop. <laughs> it's not a Tuma. It's it's a great great movie. And Young Guns too. Um, a movie that was literally stolen by John Bon Jovi. If I'm being honest, I can't believe I forgot that because I absolutely love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, something of a guilty pleasure for me is uh, sometimes every once in a while I like to watch The Godfather Part Three and pretend Winona Ryder and Robert Duvall are actually in it. <laughs> but it's not a good Godfather movie. It really isn't. But it's it does have some good parts to it it introduced the world to andy garcia and for that i have to be thankful um and i since you brought it up i'm gonna go ahead and throw young guns too on my um on my guilty pleasures as well i i had the soundtrack blaze of glory (laughs) and let me tell you it's amazing it's really good christian slater's great in this movie uh he's he's funnier than he has any right to be in a western arkansas dave rudabaugh uh and it has uh, alan rook from Ferris Bueller's yeah. Day Off. So uh, very, very young Viggo Mortensen as well um, in this movie. And then uh, the guy whose name I can't remember who went on to be Gil Grissom on CSI for uh, a lot oh. of time. He plays Pat Garrett. Um, uh, and he's really good. Yeah. William Peterson. Yeah. William guy. Peterson. Yeah. 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 So. Really enjoyed it. Young Guns too. The Young Guns movies are just fantastic. I mean. Oh, they're a lot of fun. For, you know, teenagers in the 90s, like we had some rock star Outlaws, and we had rock stars great. doing the soundtrack too, because exactly. like John Bon Jovi just brought his A game to that soundtrack. Well, Kiefer Kiefer Sutherland is so he's so sweet in these movies. He just, you know, Kiefer Kiefer Sutherland is so underrated as an actor. Uh, he really is, and so is his dad, actually, in really? a way, in a lot of ways. I think we might talk about him in '91. I don't know. Yeah, it's just, possible. just saying, <laughs> that's the thing. So that about wraps it up for us, uh, folks or folk. I don't know. Maybe there's one of you, Bob. I think you're listening. I hope um, Bob's a friend, guys. But anybody named Bob, we're happy to have, uh, or anything else. So <laughs> thank you for uh, joining us for our first ever inaugural episode. Inaugural episode, 1990. Gen X Cinema Geeks. We are siblings. We are geeks. <laughs> that's really the only thing we claim no to be. Here. The only thing we actually claim to be um, just opinionated geeks who like watching movies. And uh, we will continue to do this as long as we want to talk about it. And yeah. we hope you will follow along. We hope you will, uh, you know, follow our podcast and listen to us yammer a little bit more on the years to come. And let me tell you, the 90s are about to get real good. Yeah. So um, by all means, follow along. We yeah, appreciate I like, it. I feel like 1990 was kind of a, like a soft intro to the 90s. <laughs> like they weren't quite sure they were in the 90s yet because there's still a lot of movies that felt very 80s. Yeah, it was like a soft restaurant opening where you got to test yeah. out the kitchen yeah. to see if anybody, you know, if you have the capacity for what's about to come. Yeah, but by 1991, they were firing on all cylinders. So. Yeah, it's going to get good, guys. It's going to get real good. Yeah. So thanks for joining us. We hope you join us again. 
Uh, and we will see you in 1991. Bye. Bye. Bye.